calling himself a genius and responding to accusations about his mental fitness, all while hosting Republican congressional leaders at Camp David to advance the GOP's 2018 agenda. Good evening, everyone. I'm Julie Banderas. You're watching The Fox Report. The president lashing out at journalist Michael Wolf just hours ago from the presidential retreat in Maryland as senior lawmakers and cabinet members looked on. The president taking issue with Wolf's claim that 100 percent of the people around the president question his intelligence and fitness for office. The president even going as far to argue his qualifications and saying that they speak for. Ran themselves. for president one time and won. And then I hear this guy that uh, does it not know me? Doesn't know me at all. By the way, did not interview me for three. He said he interviewed me for three hours in the White House. It didn't exist, okay? It's in his imagination. I did a quick interview with him a long time ago having to do with an article. But I don't know this man. I guess uh, Sloppy Steve brought him into the White House quite a bit, and it was one of those things. That's why Sloppy Steve is now looking for a job. Rich Edson is following all of the new developments from the White House. That was an entertaining news conference, I must say. Rich, what else is the president saying about his mental fitness? Now, good evening, Julie. And the president was defending his mental fitness, attacking Michael Wolf for the early part of this morning. It started at 7.30 a.m. on Twitter. The president tweeting, quote, Actually, throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being, like, really smart. Crooked Hillary Clinton also played these cards very hard and, as everyone knows, went down in flames. I went from very successful businessman to top TV star to president of the United States on my first try. I think that would qualify as not smart, but genius and a very stable genius at that. Now, earlier this week, the president's attorney sent a letter to Michael Wolf and his publishers asking them to cease and desist any further dissemination of their book, but... They responded by moving up the release date of that book, Julie. What are Republicans at the Camp David retreat saying, Rich, about trying to advance their agenda in 2018? Because that is and should be the focus here. Yeah, and that was the intent of this meeting at Camp David this weekend. They want to figure out their legislative strategy, what they want to push, and how they want to negotiate or deal with Democrats. So there was a, a discussion of that, and they detailed that. But before even getting into that, Republicans wanted to talk about 2017 and what they say was a very successful year. If you are like those of us here uh, at the podium, you'd like to see America be a right-of-center country. Uh, from a right of center point of view, uh, 2017 was the most consequential year in the many years that I've been here in Congress. The Senate Majority Leader mentioned judicial nominees and the tax law the president signed last month. As for 2018, Republicans say they want to talk or they did discuss strategy on budgeting. Congress has to s pass a spending bill by January 19th or part of the government shuts down. Longer term budgeting, military spending and a lot of attention on immigration. That's what the president went through. They talked about DACA. That's the Obama era uh, policy that protects protects those brought to the United States illegally as children from deportation. The president is phasing that out. He says Republicans want to extend those protections, but they want something in exchange for that. They want to end chain migration. They want money for border security on the southern border. Uh, and they, they also uh, are looking to end the visa lottery system as part of that jewelry. Rich, the president also making some news on North Korea. Right. This is the Trump administration has been leading for months what it calls a pressure campaign. It's to isolate North Korea from the rest of the world economically and diplomatically. Well, now U.S. ally South Korea is going to be talking to North Korea next month, perhaps about North Korean athletes participating in the Olympics next month in uh, South Korea. To that, the president said he welcomes it. We have a very good relationship with South Korea. I would love to see it go far beyond the Olympics. Absolutely. And at the appropriate time, we'll get involved. Analysts say they worry that what North Korea is trying to do here is drive a wedge between South Korea and the United States on this issue. Uh, the United States and the Trump administration said they have been willing to talk to North Korea only if the Kim Jong-un regime changes its mm -hmm. behavior from firing missiles and testing nuclear weapons, Julie. All right. Rich Edson, thank you very much. And just ahead, we are going to be delving into further into the president's comments today. Is bipartisanship in the future and which issues really could bring Republicans and Democrats together? Also, the president weighs in on his role in the upcoming midterms. And as you might imagine, he won't be sitting on the sidelines. But he said there's one thing he probably 
won't be doing. We'll be talking about that coming up. Meantime, the president also speaking out about two other issues dogging his administration, his attorney general, and the Russian investigation. Do you stand by Jeff Sessions as your attorney general? Yes, I do. The president also reiterated there was no collusion between his campaign and the Russian government. There's been no crime. And in theory, everybody tells me I'm not under investigation. Maybe Hillary is, I don't know, but I'm not. But there's been no collusion. There's been no crime. But we have been very open. We could have done it two ways. We could have been very close and it would have taken years. But you know, it's sort of like when you've done nothing wrong, let's be open and get it over with. Because honestly, it's very, very bad for our country. It's making our country look foolish. Meanwhile, Republican senators calling for action against the author of the Trump dossier, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Charles Grassley, along with Senator Lindsey Graham, urging the Justice Department to open a criminal investigation against Christopher Steele. They believe Steele lied to the FBI about his contacts with reporters. Caroline Shively has the latest on this from Washington. So Caroline, what law do the senators believe Christopher Steele might have actually broken? Julie, they think lying to federal investigators. It's actually nicknamed the Martha Stewart statute after breaking it got her sent to prison. Under U.S. code, it is illegal to lie to a federal agent about an ongoing investigation. Steele was on the payroll of opposition research firm Fusion GPS when he started talking with reporters about the contents of that dossier, trying to get them to write story. Graham and Grassley think Steele may have lied about that interaction with journalists. Steele's project was later partially funded by the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign. The veracity of the contents of the dossier is still disputed. The criminal referral makes no judgment on that. Graham and Grassley laid out their suspicions about Steele in a letter to the Justice Department. Members of Congress can't levy criminal charges, but they can flag them to the DOJ for more review. Many Republicans still want to know if the dossier sparked the entire FBI investigation into possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. This all goes to how did this investigation into this collusion begin with law enforcement? What was Christopher Steele's role? Who was he working with in the, in the Justice Department or the FBI people? This is the first known criminal referral from Congress as part of the Russia investigation. Julie? This referral, Caroline, angered Democrats. Tell us why. Sure, they call it a distraction and say they were left out of the entire thing. Senator Richard Blumenthal, who is also on the Judiciary Committee, said this, quote, This action was taken without any bipartisan cooperation or even consultation. These vaguely stated secret allegations seem designed more to distract attention from the priority issues for investigation and discredit the FBI and other law enforcement. The DOJ doesn't have to take up the referral, but the Judiciary Committee has oversight over the entire Justice Department. So coming from Grassley and Graham, it will most likely be a priority, Julie. All right, Caroline Shively, thank you. Protesters on both sides of the political and cultural divide are hitting the streets yet again in Iran. Now weeks of demonstrations, thousands of pro-government supporters actually turning out for a fourth day of staged rallies to counter the wave of anti-government protesters that have been going on, basically putting the regime on edge. And here in our country, there was a rally as well outside the White House. This one on behalf of those anti-government protesters. In attendance, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. This is a dictatorship that does not represent the people of Iran, that survives only by being willing to kill and imprison dissidents, and which has again and again and again been faced with the people of Iran trying to break free. Kitty Logan has more on the unrest and how the Iranian government is pointing fingers at the U.S. Hi, Julie. Well, government-backed rallies took place in several Iranian towns and cities again today, with thousands out on the streets. The first protest appeared in the north of the country, but spread elsewhere. People waved Iranian flags and chanted anti-U.S. and anti-Israel slogans. Iranian state TV says they're in direct response to days of demonstrations against the government, which began back on December 28th. The Iranian government has cracked down on those protests, and in response to that crackdown, the U.S. yesterday called a meeting at the U.N. The Iranian government reacted angrily to the U.S. decision to call that meeting, criticizing it as a mistake. But the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, says the meeting has put Iran on notice. 
She says anti-government protests in Iran are a human rights issue. At least 21 people have been killed and up to a thousand arrested in anti-government protests. Those protests were first about the economy, such as high unemployment and the rise on food prices. But anger was soon directed towards the Iranian leadership. The demonstrations spread to around 80 places but have been fading in recent days. The Iranian government has blamed foreign interference for the demonstrations and staged a series of pro-government protests to counter them. And of course, President Trump has clearly backed the anti-government protesters, but it seems for now that movement may have been stalled by the Iranian government crackdown. Julie? Katie Logan, thank you. Right now, Republicans are laying out a strategy for bipartisan immigration reform while pushing for border security. President Trump says there's no deal on DACA without funding for the wall to the tune of at least $18 billion. So can the GOP and Democrats find common ground? We're going to talk about it live in an interview coming up. Plus, a, a U.S. state is actually ramping up its feud with the White House on immigration, the new law that just went into effect and how the administration is planning to fight it. President Trump and Republicans talking immigration reform at their Camp David retreat. The president reiterating he is hoping to strike a deal with Democrats to protect hundreds of thousands of dreamers from deportation. But he says it is not happening without funding for the border wall, which is, by the way, to the tune of at least $18 billion. Democrats are not so happy about that price tag. For more on this, we go to Garrett Tenney in Washington. And Julie, this plan is the first detailed blueprint we have of the Trump administration's vision for its wall along the U.S. southern border, and it calls for a major expansion of border security. The Wall Street Journal viewed a copy of the document, which was shared with a number of senators on Friday, and reports the first phase of the plan would cost $18 billion, take 10 years to complete, and include more than 700 miles of new and replacement barriers along the southern border. The document also reportedly lays out the changes to immigration policy that President Trump has demanded to be included in any deal to address DACA and allow the dreamers to remain in the country. We want the wall. The wall's going to happen or we're not going to have DACA. Uh, we want to get rid of chain migration. Very important. And we want to get rid of the lottery system. In addition to that, we want some money for funding. We need some additional border security. These are great people. And we need some border security. We need ICE. But we want to make sure that in terms of uh, what we want, and we, we want DACA to happen. Democrats are slamming the administration's plan for a border wall, including Senator Dick Durbin, who said the president may be pushing Congress towards a government shutdown with this latest proposal, adding it's outrageous that the White House would undercut months of bipartisan efforts by again trying to put its entire wish list of hardline anti-immigrant bills plus an additional $18 billion in wall funding on the backs of these young people. Several items that were notably not included in the administration's plans are what kinds of barriers or walls will be used, where along the border this initial phase will be built, and how the White House plans to make Mexico pay for it. Julie? All right, Garrett Tenney from Washington, thank you very much. Well, the acting director of ICE is laying down the gauntlet over a so-called sanctuary state law taking effect in California. The legislation is in open defiance of the White House, barring police officers from enforcing federal immigration policies. Chief Correspondent Jonathan Hunt has more. If you think ICE is going away, we're not. There's no sanctuary from federal law enforcement. The acting ICE director is not making any attempt to hide his anger at California's new laws and its governor for not supporting much of the work of federal immigration authorities. And as a result, Thomas Honan says, ICE is going to put a lot more boots on the ground. California better hold on tight. They're, they're about to see a lot more special agents, a lot more deportation officers in the state of California. If the politicians in California don't want to protect their communities, then ICE will. California has never officially declared itself a sanctuary state. The legislation is called the California Values Act. Critics, of course, say it amounts to the same thing. Put simply, the new laws strictly limit the extent to which local law enforcement agencies can cooperate with federal immigration agents. In a newspaper opinion piece, California's Democratic Senate leader, Kevin DeLeon, said, quote, Drafting local police into Trump's immigration crackdown undermines public safety and is a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars. 
adding that the law, quote, will prevent the Trump administration from hijacking our state and local police to enforce federal immigration laws. The acting ICE director wants politicians like De Leon, who pass so-called sanctuary laws, to face prosecution. More citizens are going to die because of these policies, and these politicians can't make these decisions and be held unaccountable for people dying. I mean, we, we need to hold these politicians accountable for their actions. Does the president share your view, sir? Absolutely he does. It is clear that neither the Trump administration nor the state of California is going to back down in this immigration standoff, which appears likely to only become more intense in 2018. In Los Angeles, Jonathan Hunt, Fox News. An American hero has passed away. The life and legacy astronaut John Young left behind after serving our nation for decades. Also, an estimated 100 million people are under a blanket of frigid air following a blizzard that shut down the East Coast. And the below freezing temperatures are expected to stick around. That's next on the Fox Report. An American hero who commanded the first space shuttle mission has passed away. Astronaut John Young will be remembered as one of NASA's pioneers. Young was the only agency astronaut to go into space as part of the Gemini, Apollo and Space Shuttle programs. Among his many other accomplishments, he was the first man to fly into space six times and the ninth to walk on the moon. He died last night in Houston following complications from pneumonia. John Young was 87 years old. Well, first, it was a bomb cyclone. Now, 100 million people are under one giant blanket of Arctic air that refuses to lighten up. Take a look at wind chills across the nation as gusts add to this intensity of a deep freeze, making conditions even more miserable and dangerous. And that is why we stick Brian Yenis out in the thick of it. He's outside Fox News headquarters here in New York City, Brian. Hey, Julie. Well, yeah, this is a wind chill advisory for much of the Northeast and the Midwest. This is dangerously cold, just a biting frigid air after this, uh, after this, um, after this storm that just hit, and uh, I was just thinking of the nickname, the bomb cyclone. How can I forget? I've been saying it for a week, but that storm came in and this Arctic freeze came in. Look at these temperatures, the wind chills, negative six wind chill in Pittsburgh, negative 10 degrees in Boston, negative two degrees here in New York City for the wind chill, negative 18 in upstate New York in Watertown, and four degrees in Washington, D.C. with the wind chills right now. Tomorrow morning, the forecast is for negative four in Boston. That's just the temperature. Negative four tomorrow morning in Boston. That'll break a record set in 1896. There's one degree in New York. It'll be one degree below zero in Cleveland tomorrow morning, even 17 degrees in Charleston, South Carolina. And the wind chills tomorrow morning, forget it. Negative 23 in Boston, zero degrees in D.C., negative 23 in Detroit. You get it. It's just frigid. And if you look at this, this is actually a river in New Jersey, just frozen solid. It's not just that the temperatures are cold. It's the duration of the cold. We've been cold for just for a couple of weeks now, this Arctic blast. And look at this. This video is out of Boston and Revere, Boston, right out of the city there. This town was one of the many, the 32 coastal communities that got entrenched with that significant flooding from that storm. And now you've got vehicles that are frozen solid in salt water and ice. And on top of that now, they've had to deal with this freezing temperatures. It's actually so cold, Julie. Mount Washington in New Hampshire is the second coldest place in the entire world right now. Minus 36 degrees, so cold, they blew bubbles and they actually froze in the air hard like baseballs. You can see the guy picking it up. Just incredible. That's from the Mount Washington Observatory. So yeah, it's cold. It's going to snow and probably be wet on Monday. Then come Tuesday, Wednesday, it'll be a balmy 30 degrees. So there's that. Hi, Mom. Oh, there's Arthel. Oh, hey, Arthel. <laughs> Arthel, Arthel Noble Arthel. is, is photobombing your live you know, shot. You're supposed to, like, ignore people that walk by. I literally was like, oh, another stalker. I, uh, I was like, oh, here's another person. She's, she's staying warm, though. It's good to yeah. see you, Arthel. Tell her I like yeah. her coat. <laughs> she she uh, really loves your coat. Um, all yeah. right, so we got to get back to work now. Enough yeah. of this funny business. But, no, in all seriousness, it's not funny at the airports. In fact, a day after the storm, it was incredible. I was out at LaGuardia. There were some 8,000 delays still and over 1500 cancellations the airlines have been a mess in the airports yeah airlines have been a mess and at JFK airport this morning there was such a delay hours yeah. and hours three four five up to 20 hours people stuck on the tarmac in fact people were so bored they started playing violin 
You know, there's nothing you can do when you're in the JFK airport. You got to figure out what to do. I mean, it was just hours of delays. In fact, you know, there was people left on their airplanes in the tarmac without food, without water, without toilets. And that's because there were so many inbound flights that were set to JFK today, there wasn't enough gates for them. So people, the Port Authority had to bring in portable staircases, take people off their planes, buses to their terminals. It was a mess this morning. And a couple of the tweets, one tweet, guy says JFK is an embarrassment. Flight Adolinas 1300, five hours in the airport, with no information regarding the status of our bags. There are pregnant women, babies, and children on this flight. There's no toilet, food, or water available. Disgraceful. Apparently, it's a little better now, but gridlock situation at JFK uh, gives you an idea that this backlog lasts for days after the storm, Julie. I'm going to keep this live shot going so you stand out there in those temperatures. What is the temp right now? I can't even see it from here. What is it? It's, it's 10 degrees, and oh. it feels like negative 2. Oh, yeah. Let's do this another 10 minutes then. Um, there's this tweet from Steve Whiteman, and I just want to read it real quick. Uh, Dear Fox News, he's talking about Brian. I don't know what terrible thing Brian Yenis did, but to have him out in hurricanes and then this miserable cold all the time is unconscionable. I mean, I'm sure he's sorry for or whatever it was. Please let him back inside. Thank you. The answer, uh, Mr. Steve, no. He's going to stay outside. I asked him to blow bubbles and have them freeze in the air. He did not My, do that for me. God bless. God bless Steve. Yeah. My mother loves him. He's looking out for me. <laughs> I love this job. It's part of it, you know, but I appreciate him looking out for me. I know. But if there was a pile of snow behind you, I'd make you fall oh, back into I it know. regardless. I know. I know. you. <sighs> but you're still an angel in my eyes. Thank you very much, Brian <laughs> Yannis. Get inside. Stay warm. <laughs> Bye. Well, the Trump administration targeting another Obama policy, this one dealing with the environment and energy. So why is it upsetting some Republicans? We'll discuss. Plus, President Trump and Republicans giving some insight into their strategy for this year's midterms. The president says he will certainly hit the campaign trail. But what could that mean in terms of backing any insurgent candidates targeting the GOP establishment? They want me to be uh, involved, and we're going to be very involved, in fact, not only with the Senate, also with the House. And protecting incumbents, or will you... Uh... Protecting incumbents and uh, whoever I have to protect. And it's a DACA and how we're going to do, and we hope that we're going to be able to work out an arrangement with the Democrats. I think it's something that they'd like to see happen. It's something, certainly, that I'd like to see happen. We hope that 2018 will be a year of more bipartisan cooperation and the president's agenda. We've got issues such as infrastructure that we want to attend to. We want to make sure that Secretary Mattis and our military have the tools and the resources that they need to keep us safe. So we have a very bold agenda for 2018. We think this agenda is one that will appeal to everyone in between, between Democrats and Republicans, independents. President Trump and Republican leaders striking a bipartisan tone as they lay the groundwork this weekend for their 2018 agenda. Let's bring in Haley Byrd, congressional reporter for the Weekly Standard. Haley, thank you very much for talking to us. All right, a lot of different issues to discuss here. I want to start with DACA because Senators Chuck Grassley, John Cornyn, uh, they have both proposed to extend DACA for a few years uh, so dreamers can apply for citizenship. Uh, these are Republican senators. Le need me remind our viewers. Um, and I guess they're trying to meet in the middle with Democrats, but will other Republicans side with them? You know, that's a good question. And I think in the House, that's even more uh, of, an, of an interest for Republicans to try to find uh, consensus within their party. You know, right now, within the Republican Party, the DACA negotiations are staying within the party, um, even though they're searching for this bipartisan deal. And that's because those immigration stances between Republicans do vary so much. So then top Democrats say that Trump's immigration demands could lead to a government shutdown. Where do Democrats stand on protecting our borders, first of all? And are they going to negotiate with Republicans uh, on key issues like ending chain migration, ending the visa lottery, and toughening border security? Well, I think in the past we've seen that Democrats have been open to negotiating in terms of border security. You know, additional measures have passed in different appropriations bills, and Democrats have done that. Uh, in order to keep the government open and running. Um, and in this one, Trump is sort of pushing for this specific funding for the border wall, which Democrats have sort of said, you know, this is the line we're not going to cross. We'll give you more money for, for enforcement, but maybe not a border wall. Right. Um, so so that, I think that is the question that is uh, the White House is pushing this time. Right. And, and I mean, President Trump is saying no DACA deal without the wall. Democrats are saying $18 billion what? Um, so immigration reform isn't obviously getting off on the right foot. Uh, what other, uh, you know, agendas will top uh, the to-do list in 2018? 
So uh, Paul Ryan in the House is talking about entitlement reform, uh, you know, cuts to spending, uh, whereas a lot of other Republicans, uh, including President Trump and McConnell, and Ryan has, you know, shown a little bit of interest, but I, I'm not really sure what the degree of interest is in infrastructure within the Republican Party, especially because it is such a bipartisan issue and, you know, different funding mechanisms might not be conservative enough for them. Uh, like maybe raising the fuel tax or something like that to help pay for, you know, this this boost in infrastructure um, construction. Right. All right. Speaking 2018, that leads me to my next question. And it's the midterm elections, because a lot is riding on this year, especially for uh, Republicans, because the 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 my the, the you know, the majority over Republicans versus Senate uh, Democrats, rather, in the Senate uh, has narrowed quite a bit. Forty nine fifty one, I believe. Uh, so when asked if he will be involved in this year's elections, here's what President Trump had to say. They want me to be uh, involved and we're going to be very involved. In fact, not only with the Senate, also with the House. And protecting incumbents, or will you... Uh, protecting incumbents and uh, whoever I have to protect. Look, we need more Republicans. We have to have more Republicans. With that being said, I think we're going to go bipartisan. I think we're going to have some really great bipartisan bills. But we need more Republicans so that we can really get the rest of the Make America Great Again agenda passed. So that includes some challengers to incumbents, too? I don't see it. I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening at this moment. No, I think they've sort of scattered. We had somebody that lost us, the state of Alabama. So, you know, he just mentioned Alabama. Coming off the heels of the loss in Alabama, how is President Trump viewed when it comes to his support for candidates? You know, that's a good question that I think a lot of Republicans are asking after Steve Bannon's departure and this uh, clear rift between them after uh, Michael Wolff's book has come out. Um, and I, I believe after Alabama, the president has made clear uh, that he's sort of siding with Republican uh, establishment, especially when it comes to campaigns and elections. Uh, you saw on Twitter McConnell's team posted a gif of McConnell looking just pleased after Trump released his statement about Bannon, uh, just dragging him basically after all those quotes came out. Um, so, so when he said that today, I believe he's sort of confirming you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to be on the side of the Republicans in 2018. Okay. Um, so basically, the fallout of the book was one, clearly, that has agitated the president. He calls it a work of fiction. Um, but in it, uh, you know, basically, you have Michael Bannon at one time, who was highly respected by the president, um, a confidant. He advised him on some of the president's most important issues, including the travel ban. Well, now it turns out he's a rat. Shocker. And the president actually called him out on Twitter last night. And I think this tweet sort of got covered up today because of his most recent tweet about his mental stability. So I want to read this because I got this on my phone at about 1130 last night. Michael Wolf is, Wolf is a total loser who made up stories in order to sell this really boring and untruthful book. He used sloppy Steve Bannon who cried when he got fired and begged for this job. Well, now sloppy Steve has been dumped like a dog by almost everyone too bad. Is this a distraction to the president's agenda or just another bump in the road? You know, we've been asking that question for the past year in Congress, and I think sometimes it does distract Republican members of Congress, but, you know, they're, they're doing their best to keep their eyes away from the car crash that is happening um, whenever the president tweets. So the agenda, I believe, it, it's really based in Congress. Okay. Um, that at least that's what they say. I think it makes it harder for them to work with the executive branch because they don't really know what he's going to say next. Okay, so then now they need to figure out what to tackle next. Um, and how do they get bipartisan support? Because Republican leaders have debated whether to tackle conservative agendas like entitlement reform or maybe take on matters that have a stronger chance of winning the Democrats over, such as infrastructure. So how do they decide which to push when considering the midterms? Exactly. The, what they're going to consider the most is the midterms and what, and what voters in general are looking for. Um, entitlement reform isn't very popular among older voters, especially on an election year. Um, and another challenge to that is that you need 60 votes in the Senate, and so it would be difficult to do something like that. Um, on the other hand, you have infrastructure, and you'd have to work with the other party to work on that. Mm -hmm. And another question that Democrats are asking is, is it worth it to work on a bipartisan bill? Uh, when they see Trump is so toxic, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the in the grand scheme of things, they're asking, you know, maybe we pass an infrastructure bill, but does that hurt us in the long term if Trump's signature is on it? 
All right, Haley Bird, thank you very much. We appreciate you talking thank to you. us. Thank you. Well, the Trump administration on a collision course with environmentalists as well as some Republican governors as it moves to open nearly all U.S. coastal waters to offshore drilling. William Lajeunesse has the details. We need to know the facts before we allow deep water drilling to continue. The Deepwater Horizon spill prompted President Obama to rescind plans to open parts of the Gulf and the Atlantic to drilling. I've issued a six-month moratorium on deep water drilling. That six months became seven years, and on Thursday, President Trump torpedoed that legacy. This is a dramatic departure from previous policy. Overturning 33 years of policy, the Trump plan opens both coasts to drilling. Under President Trump, we're going to have the strongest energy policy and become the strongest energy superpower. To achieve that, the administration wants to open 47 new areas for leasing. Each block represents thousands of acres. If approved, companies can explore and potentially drill for oil and gas. We have currently 94% of our offshore resources off limits. And this is an opportunity to open up more of those areas to supply growing demand. We already um, have efforts on the ground to oppose it here in the state of California. Environmentalists promise to fight any drilling proposal as do Western governors who accuse the president of ignoring climate change and the risk to wildlife. We are in and united in our opposition to this move by the president. The threat of lawsuits is one reason major companies are reluctant to change long-term drilling plans. They also fear a future administration may flip Trump's decision. Federal waters extend three to 200 miles off the coast, offering political and economic challenges. But the real answers may lie beneath, where seismic testing can show how much oil exists and if it's worth drilling for. Every administration must issue a five-year plan for the nation